Welcome to One Symphony, a podcast that explores classical music's relevance in our modern lives. I'm conductor Devin Patrick Hughes, and I'm here to share with you stories and conversations with musicians, composers, and artistic entrepreneurs that aim to unite us into one symphonic world. Marina Arsenievich is an international award-winning pianist and composer, star of the Emmy-nominated public television program, Marina at West Point, Unity Through Diversity, which has been broadcast to more than 170 million viewers on PBS stations all across the country. Marina created the program and performed with the 120-member joint ensemble of the West Point Band and the West Point Cadet Glee Club. The concert was recorded live at West Point's historic Eisenhower Hall and, as of 2020, became one of the longest-running single concerts at PBS's TV network. Welcome, Marina, to One Symphony today. I'm really excited to speak with you. You've got an incredible new album, Chopin Obsessions. And I just love to get started by asking you about your inspirations. I've heard it's from Chopin all the way to Freddie Mercury and Paul McCartney and Billy Joe and Elton John. Can you talk a little bit about how that crossover happened? Yes. Hi, Devin. And thank you so much for inviting me to your really beautiful podcast. I've listened to a few of your interviews and they're all so insightful and beautiful topics. So I'm happy to chat with you today. I grew up in former Yugoslavia, which is now Serbia. Ever since I was a child, I started with the classical ballet. My father was this quite famous soccer player and he always played some music. So I guess I was surrounded by all kinds of music and that's how my interest in music started. My love for music actually started at the ballet class when I was four years old and I really didn't like to dance and I would stand by piano accompanist. So I was very shortly after transferred to just piano classes, but since my parents really loved all sorts of music, I was early on exposed to different genres. And even though at the time when I was growing up, it was communism in former Yugoslavia, I was able to be exposed to the Western pop music at the time and also traditional music. We would be celebrating every month several times, some holidays, and it would be always traditional music around me played by, it's like a Russian balalaika instrument. So it's between Russian and I would say Mediterranean Greek sound. So... As a child, that certainly has a big influence on how you grow up with music. Certainly, I didn't know I would stick with piano forever. That become my life and career. But I would say that really influenced me, helped me to find my voice in the world that was pretty turbulent where I grew up. You talk about how your only weapon is your music during war and conflict and disagreements. Can you expound on that a little bit? So the disintegration of Yugoslavia started in 91, and I got my master's degree at 93. I started a professional career pretty early on, but I realized that I cannot fully express myself through just playing classical music. I have been, at the time, influenced by all these different nations around me and different religions. In our part was Muslim and Christian music. And also, obviously, you have all sorts of other influences there. I want to show our common humanity through history, culture, through music. So I started to blend diverse melodies and rhythms to unite us. 
it went through the 90s like that, even though I performed with uh, orchestras, every possible concerto from Tchaikovsky to Chopin, Brahms, and everything. But I always tried to involve some type of traditional music into some of my own little miniature piano compositions. When finally my town was bombed in 1999, Belgrade, which was the capital of Yugoslavia, by that time, the country was all apart and many different countries were created. I was able to play during the bombing, which was three months in our case, different compositions for people to find their own solitude and to find hope. So I have performed everywhere in shopping malls, wherever there would be a place for people to gather. That was actually the year when my first album came out for Slovenian. At the time, Slovenia was already a separate country. And I published the album called My Balkan Soul. That album later on became pretty well received in 11 European countries. So I toured Europe with that Balkan Soul which is, as I say, a mixture of different melodies and rhythms I heard while I was growing up. And I would say it, it is obviously a classical treatment of a composition. So you've been performing, especially early in your career, concertos with orchestra. Can yes. you talk about how that evolved into a very well-known PBS special, Marina Arsenievich with West Point Chorus and Band? That's a very interesting story. It's called actually Marina at West Point, Unity Through Diversity. So when I came to the United States, it was just right after bombing of Serbia. I had to start from really bought them from zero, even though I had performed in Europe and sold albums and stuff. So it took a while for me to find my own way here in the United States. So in 2003, I got the opportunity to perform in Carnegie Hall. It was the first concert I had, and that was really well received, got good critics. And that concert was my Balkan soul. The second one, I had the year later was called Marina in America. It was from Gershwin to Franz Liszt to my own music. At one of those concerts later on, I met a lady who was the editor of PBS special. And she asked me, would I record or film something for them so they can see if the national PBS would accept it. So that time didn't work. And a little later on, I was approached to do a concert at West Point. And one of the, I called them surrogate American parents. He was alumni of West Point, the class of 1948. And at 2007, I believe, he said they would be interested in talking. And I said, I think that I would do unity through diversity since I went through wars and I understand how unity is important for nations to survive and understanding the strength in diversity and through music, I thought it's the best way to communicate and to understand because music relates to everyone and you can, without words, touch every soul. That's how I created the program with Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, Trans Hungarian Rhapsody, Bohemian Rhapsody by Freddie Mercury, mixed with my compositions that I started back in 2000, but now they evolved into something else and rearranged with American orchestrators. We ended up with a different arrangement of America the Beautiful that I performed at the White House for First Lady Laura Bush in honor of Cherry Blair in 2003 where I used Chopin's revolutionary attitude into the America the Beautiful to show my way to United States from turbulence to freedom of expression. 
So that's how that show happened. I just had an interview with them and the conductor at the time, Holtain, said, oh, I think this is great. Uh, public relations colonel that was at the time at West Point thought that promoting diversity was very important for the academy because they had students from 26 different nations. So that's how it started. I really never performed with just band and the full choir without having strings, but they had a fantastic composer, Douglas Richard, who was employed at West Point as a musician, and he took all my compositions and reorchestrated them for band and chorus. So it was 120 people on stage besides me, and it was really something unbelievable. It took nine months of me working with them on the campus, and then PBS, actually two stations together with the American Public Television, they were involved. And the director was the same one that did all the Yanni shows in Acropolis and Taj Mahal. So he understood that grandiose live concert. Also, we had Green was audio engineer at the time. He was doing all the live Grammys, Oscars, Tony, everything. At the time, he had a hundred microphones. I think today probably you can flash that to much less. But at the time, he had hundred microphones because the balance between a piano as a soloist and the full band and the chorus, they have to balance that sound. I cannot overpower trumpets and horns and others. Can you talk about the difference as a piano soloist performing with a band? like you said, and with an orchestra, so minus the strings. It was interesting that I really didn't feel that much difference because Douglas Richard was so good that he was able to transfer strings into woodwinds instruments. You feel, you hear strings, even though there were no strings. They're maybe not as flexible with rhythms, movement. So I had to be very strict in my rhythmical performance, but I really felt that he was able to transfer all the strings in what instruments. As a piano soloist and a composer, you've played a lot of the music by piano soloists like Beethoven, obviously Chopin, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, who were composers really chiefly, but also to some extent pianists or piano virtuosos. Can you talk about when that happened for you to start creating your own melodies as a composer? And do you consider yourself more of a piano soloist than a composer or vice versa? That's an interesting question. My master thesis was a uh, connection between Rachmaninoff and Franz Liszt as the latest big composers and pianists. Both of them were outstanding pianists and composers. I guess it started very early on that I understood that being an instrumentalist doesn't limit you to be just an instrumentalist. If you, as I said, different events in your life urge you to express yourself through different channels. I did not major in composition, but it was pretty strict. We had a very good schooling between Russian type of education and Western, where I had subjects that were the same as composers that musicology and treatment of melody and harmonies and stuff. So I was very good in that. It just came to me organically when I needed to express myself, as I say. But if you ask me now, yeah, I primarily performer, but I use my skills to compose. Recently, I published a composition for piano and orchestra called Tesla Rhapsody, which 
I wanted to express my knowledge of Nikola Tesla, who was like me, Serbian-American, and who gave us almost everything we have in technological sense today. He gave us alternate current. So everything that is a remote control is based on his inventions, Tesla coil. Obviously, his name became very known because of Tesla cars. Everybody are kind of intrigued. What is the name Tesla? So in that case, yes, I use my composition skills to create this rhapsody that I based on maybe rhapsody in blue or Paganini rhapsody. I would say that the different teams connect into a rhapsodic for piano and orchestra. I was able to arrange all that for piano and then I work tightly with the orchestra to, to orchestrate for a full symphony orchestra. I'd love to ask about Chopin Obsession, your new album. It centers upon, obviously, the great piano works of Frederick Chopin. One of the extra musical elements in the composer's life at that time centers around his relationships. And a lot of the music was composed for certain aristocratic women in his life. Can you talk about those relationships and maybe how some of those figures inspired some of the music? As we know, even today, you have to have a so called in artistic world, you have supporters, sponsors, in European word would be commission work. I would say that in Chopin's case, all those aristocratic women were infatuated by his talents and they commissioned the work, I believe, that he created. As many of the artists that came from, at the time, Eastern Europe, he came from Poland and Poland was under Russian aggression at the time. So how timely that is now. <laughs> we have history repeats itself, not in Poland, but in Ukraine. So many artists came from Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia at the time. Many from that gilded age became illustrators or as Chopin composer. Recently, I was invited in New York last week to see the premiere of a new musical, Lempica. And I didn't know what Lempica was, but Lempica was actually a painter who came from Czechoslovakia at the same time as Poland came to Paris. They all came to Paris as a cradle of art at the time. And she actually started to paint in Paris. She was able to survive and actually become very famous. Then you have a big illustrator from Czech Republic, Alfonso Mucha. In order for Chopin to survive, he had all this relationship with women. I'm not sure about romantic relationships. I think they were older than him, but they commissioned work. And that's how all those waltzes are dedicated to such and such countess or something. They all happened between the years of 1829 and 1847. He died very young at, I believe, 1847. What period of his life do you think he was in at that time? Do you think there was more coming? And what would we have expected to see maybe had he lived a little bit longer? Chopin is known as a very sophisticated, elegant, filigrant, that the emotions were very soft. And he, as himself, as a pianist, was very fragile almost. So I believe that if you're looking in his later work, 35 when he did Ballad in G minor, that is also on this album. He then went into a period that was structurally deeper 
in expression. So that's what I think he was going for by the end of his life. Can you talk about Chopin's relationship with Beethoven, for instance, as evident in the fantasy impromptu? The fantasy was written in 1834, and as most of his waltzes was not published while he was alive, it was published posthumously in 1855, I believe. As we know who are in a musical world, you can see the similarities with Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata because he draws these harmonic elements. The middle section would be like a second movement of Sonata in D flat major. And then the first and third movements are in C sharp minor. I would say that he was certainly influenced by Beethoven. And structurally, even though he didn't compose many sonatas, but he composed all this different form that he used that same harmonic and tonal elements as Beethoven. One of the defining features of your work is the connection through the composition of the music that you make between different ethnic or religious groups. Can you talk about how that's important as a creator and any advice for young composers or pianists trying to help to bring people together through their music making? I believe that even though it was traumatic, I probably do have advantage over other creators on this world who did not went through conflicts among diverse ethnic groups, because that really deeply affected my outlook on life and music. And the conflict in Yugoslavia, that was the only country I knew until that time. And my friends, we never discussed what ethnicity we are, what religion we are. All of a sudden, everything broke into this religious war, even though we didn't have a religion because it was a communist country when I was born. That's a pretty big impact on you as a person. And then I understand why we cannot live again in unity, how this whole thing happened, because all those individual groups of ethnic groups, they started what we call now nationalism, their nationalistic movements to show their own culture, their own ethnicity, their own this and that. They wanted independence. And that's how we now have in that region six or seven different countries. It was one of the bloodiest civil wars after World War II. Probably this one in Ukraine is now even worse, but Bosnia was pretty tough. Many people died, many people dislocated, people left to the United States. We have many refugees from Bosnia because they were mixed marriage. I understood early on to crave for peace and unity in the face of that extreme ethnic or nationalistic extremism. As a result of that, I did create that motto or hallmark, whatever you want to call it, unity in the face of diversity. As any of these composers living in a romantic era like Chopin, like Tchaikovsky, Bartok, they all had to leave their homelands and create those pieces because of some sort of aggression somewhere else, mostly in France. And they craved to save their own identity. Chopin used waltzes as a form because when he was a child, he danced on those waltzes. 
there is polka, polka waltz or whatever. They call them valzerki. And the same thing in Vienna or Strauss famous waltzes. He used traditional melodies in his own Polish background to create these compositions. The same thing with Franz Liszt, Hungarian dances, rhapsodies and stuff. Those are all traditional musical themes. Rachmaninov, also Tchaikovsky, Bela Bartok specifically, it's very Hungarian. So I would say that if you go deep into some of your childhood melodies or ethnic background melodies, you can use them because it's traditional music, not copyrighted. You can involve them in any style you want, classical, pop, rock. I was really intrigued by this Jason Derulo. I don't know, is he rap or pop? I don't understand those genres, but Jason Derulo has the song Talk Dirty. And if you hear this middle part of the refrain, it's based on ethnic Serbian trumpets. I don't know who rearranged that for him, but it's funny. Somebody used those trumpets. Israeli music used those trumpets. Arabs use. We now have Israeli-Arab conflict, but their music, if you listen to traditional music, it's quite similar. Both of them, they have similar music. So, yes, you can combine those sounds and show them their commonality because they lived next to each other. They lived together for centuries, hundreds of years. Of course, there is a lot of similarities in food, in music, in culture in general. <laughs> Well, Marina, I love your philosophy. I've always thought that music brings together what the world divides. I'm so thankful you made it through these hardships and created beauty out of this to bring so many people and musical styles together. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Devin, very much for your insightful interview. Thank you for joining us on One Symphony. Thanks to Marina Arsenievich for sharing her music and performances. You can find more info at www.marinainamerica.com. The following music was heard on today's episode. A Piece of My Sky, composed and performed by Marina Arsenievich. Gypsy Suite, from the album My Balkan Soul, composed and performed by Marina Arsenievich, available from KM Records. Armed Forces Medley, performed by Marina and the West Point Cadet Glee Club and the West Point Band from the PBS special Marina at West Point, Unity Through Diversity. The Cadenzan finale from Tesla Rhapsody, composed by Marina, made possible by the Gold Spirit Award from the Tesla Science Foundation. Chopin's Waltz in A-flat major, opus 42, Fantasy Impromptu, opus 66, and Ballad No. 1 in G minor, performed by Marina on the album Chopin Obsession, available from United World Bravo Music. Omoya from the album Balkan Sounds, composed and performed by Marina Arsenievich in the Serbian Chamber Orchestra and Chorus. Arranged by Zoran Hristik, available from United Bravo World Music. You can always find more info at onesymphony.org, including a virtual tip jar if you'd like to support the show. Please feel free to rate, review, and share the show. Until next time, thank you for being a part of the music.